Welcome to the second lecture by Professor Ramon Van Handel. Today he'll be talking about non-universality in, sorry, universality in non-asymptotic uh, random matrix theory. All right, can I talk? Please. Yes, thanks. Thank you, Arjit. So um, I um, I gave a series of lectures in the, uh, the different ISI. I can hear myself very well. Okay, ah, much better. But can they still hear me? Okay, all right. So um, I um, I gave a series of lectures and two of them are about random matrix theory. One of them that I gave in Delhi and the second lecture about random matrix theory is the one I'm giving today. So I'm not going to assume that you attended my lecture in Delhi to understand what I'm going to talk about today. But as a result, I'm going to repeat at least uh, the first, uh, you know, I'm going to give you some quick uh, overview of um, the kind of problems that we look at and the kind of theory we have, because the, the main application of what I showed you today is, is the most powerful in combination with what I said in Delhi, even though these are two sort of separate phenomena. Okay, so I'm going to, those of you who did listen to the talk in Delhi will have some common overlap in the beginning. So of course, what's the goal of random matrix theory? It's to study, I have a random matrix, right? So it's a matrix with random entries. And we want to understand the behavior of the eigenvalues of these matrices. Okay, so, um, now, in classical random matrix theory, um, one typically studies very special models right? where you can take the asymptotics of these matrices that the dimension goes to infinity and try to understand what happens, right? So, for example, matrices with IID entries, right? IID entries, or maybe symmetric matrices with IID entries, um, right? So you could take a symmetric matrix where all the entries above the diagonal are IID or something like this. These are called Wigner matrices, and they're well, very well understood. And there are various kinds of variations on these models. There are also other kinds of models that have large symmetry classes, you know, like, uh, uh, for example, that are invariant on, on, on groups like random unitary matrices. And things like that. But what these models have in common, they're very special models. They have a very particular structure. And they typically make sense in any dimension. So it makes sense to study their behavior as the dimension goes to infinity, right? For example, if I take matrices of ID entries, I can fix the distribution, and right? And just let D go to infinity. And in every dimension, I have a matrix with the same distribution of the entries. I just take more and more entries and I can let the dimension go to infinity um, and study how they behave, right? This kind of asymptotic way. And, you know, the nice thing about this is that these are very specific types of models, so one can go very, very deep and study their behavior in extreme detail. And nowadays, with, you know, in random matrix theory, the behavior of the eigenvalues of these types of models is an extremely beautiful theory, right? I mean, one can go in and zoom into the eigenvalues at the scale of their spacings, understand the limiting distributions, one can understand basically the exact behavior. Now, um, on the opposite extreme is really where I'm interested. Are matrices with more or less totally general structure, at least that we aspire to. So um, here, what you should have in mind is, is we want to do the exact opposite, right? I give you, let's fix a dimension D. And I give you a random matrix D and I want to make as few as possible assumptions about the distribution of its entries. Now, what can you, can we still say anything meaningful about this eigenvalue? So perhaps the most important, the central example for, for the kind of theory that, that I have um, are Gaussian random matrices. So say I fix X to be D by D. Let's say self adjoint I usually work, I will work implicitly always with self-adjoint matrices just so they have real eigenvalues, okay? And then we want to study the real eigenvalues. If you want to study singular values of random matrices, then you can also work with non-self-adjoint ones. But let's not, let's not uh, worry about that, okay? So we take a D by D matrix, which is self-adjoint, and the entries are joint with Gaussian. But with any 
Mean and Kuber. So this is a typical kind of model, right? Where you have some sort of totally general structure. I assume they're Gaussian, so we have a nice theory, but I want to make as few assumptions as possible about the structure of the matrix. So I'm giving you a D by D matrix and its entries can basically have any pattern of means, any pattern of variances, right? They don't have to be homogeneous at all, right? I can take all the, the each entry, I can give it its own variance. I can give them any patterns of covariances. So you can have all sorts of different dependencies, right? So you can imagine that there's a huge number of different kinds of structures that this encodes, right? This is much more general than the kind of models that are studied in classical random matrix. And now the type of question that one asks here is, you know, say that I give you such a matrix and I describe for you the mean and covariance, that's the input. Can you say anything meaningful about the behavior of the eigenvalues of these matrices, you know, as a function of the data that describes the matrix? Does it make sense? So. You know how you know we want to make as 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 general you know we have to capture as general assumptions as possible about the random matrices and try to understand what we can say about this. So, um, of course, you know in this setting you cannot hope to, um, to 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 have the the same kind of extremely precise results that one has in classical random matrix theory. But in fact, these these type of questions don't even necessarily make sense, right? Because in classical random matrix theory, you typically have a sequence of matrices of increasing dimension, and you study the asymptotics as the dimension goes to infinity, right? But here, if I say that I fix a D by D matrix of an arbitrary pattern of mean and covariances, I mean, this is a given D by D matrix, right? For every one of the D squared entry, I give you its variance, I give you its mean, I give you the covariances. I haven't even defined a sequence of matrices in increasing dimension, right? There's no natural way of taking a given and arbitrary description of the mean and covariances and defining a sequence of matrices whose dimension goes to infinity. It is what it is. I gave you one matrix. I'm asking you to say something about it. Right? So in these type of questions, typically asymptotic questions don't even really make sense in general. In general, um, you have to work with what you got, right? So the type of questions one asks here are inherently non-asymptotic in nature, right? I give you a given structure and I'm asking you to say something about this one. Right? So it's it kind of changes even the nature of the question. So, um, for the moment, let me stick with the Gaussian case. So um, what is the classical result in this area? This is, and until recently, this result was more or less the, the, you know, the only general thing that was known. So the classical result in this area is the now commute the pinch inequality of new speed eigen pk. which says that the expected norm, so I have to define, so if X is a D by D self-adjoint Gaussian matrix, and let's assume the mean is zero for simplicity, this turns out not to make much of a difference, but I'm allowing an arbitrary, a completely arbitrary pattern of covariances of the end. Okay? So any pattern of variances, any kind of dependence, and this is really very general then the expected norm of X, the operator norm, right? So the largest, the, the maximum of the absolute value of the eigenvalues is bounded by square root log D, D being the dimension, times the expectation, the norm of the expectation of X. And the beauty here is that you see, this is something I can compute explicitly given the covariances, right? Because I took the expectation of the square of the matrix Right, so this just involves the covariances of the entries. So this right-hand side over here is something that if I give you a model of a random matrix, you can compute this explicitly because it's only phrase, it's only given in terms of the data that define the model, which are the covariances of the entry. Whereas on this side, I have the operator norm, a very complicated nonlinear functions of the entries of the data. And more or less by Jensen inequality, this, this inequality is always sharp up to the square root log, right? So we have a lower bound which is by the same parameter without the square root log D. This is basically just Jensen inequality. I can just write the norm of X squared is the norm of X squared. And then you can by convexity, you can move the expectation, right? So despite it, so this is kind of an amazing result, right? Because despite the fact now, in contrast to classical random matrix theory, we allowed basically any pattern of dependencies, of variances, right? And yet we can pin down the range of the spectrum up to a factor of square root log D. This is a factor that grows only logarithmically in the dimension. So we assume nothing and we get almost, let's say optimal results up to a factor square root log D. But of course, as D goes to infinity, this result becomes useless. <laughs> 
because the upper and the lower bounds there. So, um, yes. Twiddle there means there's another constant which you're not telling us, right? And this little, this inequality with the twiddle means there's a universal constant. <laughs> I'm not telling you, but you know, it's two. Okay. So, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Or square root two, and this for this inequality, I think we had it was square root. Some absolute constant doesn't depend on anything. Um, so on the one hand, this is a rather amazing result, but on the other hand, compared to the kind of information we get in classical or in the matrix theory, this is a very embarrassing result, right? It doesn't even capture correctly the the norm of Bigler matrices, right? The matrices with ID entries should not have the square root log. So what I talked about in Delhi is that we now have a theory that in many cases is able to actually pin down the norm of such random matrices exactly, by which I mean of, uh, by one plus little over. Okay. And this is not what this talk is about, but I just want to um, give you an idea of, of where we're trying to come from, right? So the, the, um, there is a sharp kind of non-asymptotic theory, which is joint work with Alfonso Bandera and Mark Chukudi Arjo. So what it means is that in many cases, we can understand, um, let's say the expectation of the norm, but or the distribution of the norm, right? for basically arbitrarily structured the Gaussian random matrices, sharply up to a factor one plus little over. Okay, so really like, like we can get the exact answer up to a small amount. Okay, I have to explain what is little over one, right? And I also have to explain what is the leading term, right? What is, what is coming in the leading term? So in fact, one has to define the right object. So it turns out the way we do this is to every random matrix, we associate some new object X free. So every Gaussian random matrix, we associate some object X free. So this is a Gaussian random matrix. And this is some kind of deterministic operator. Which is defined by a recipe from the Gaussian, from the structure of the Gaussian matrix, right? So there's some recipe given the means and the covariances of the entries of X to construct a deterministic operator corresponding to a random matrix of those means and covariances of the entries. And basically, what we show is that the, for example, the norm of X is is often close to the norm of X free, and the spectral distribution of X is often close to the spectral distribution of X free, right? And the nice thing on this side, this deterministic object, which comes from free probability theory, we can compute everything explicitly, right? So it gives us a way of computing exactly what happens up to, up to one plus little more. And of course, it's not always true that these two things behave in the same way. So the, there is some parameter that determines what, how close is this approximation, but this parameter turns out to be small in the vast majority of examples one might look at. So just to give you an example of such a result, so a kind of analog of that result over there, but with the sharp leading order term, would be an inequality that looks like this. So we can have the expected norm of X. So here we have a Gaussian random matrix, self is joint. I'm not even assuming that the mean is zero. Uh, let's assume the mean is zero. So let's assume for simplicity that we're in the same setting as here. So this is bounded by the norm of X3, right, with constant one. Okay plus some term which is typically of smaller order than that, but not always, right? So the, the relevant parameter here is the norm of the covariance matrix of the entries of X. And there is some power of log D. Okay. Um, so this X is a D by D matrix. So it has D squared entries. This object here is just a d squared by d squared covariance matrix of the entries of X. Right? And the norm of that matrix is the parameter that determines how good is the approximation of X by X. And just to compare it with that result, for X3, we can, for example, show that this is bounded by two times the parameter that shows up in the <laughs> Kinsey unit. 
So in the non-communication inequality, we have here square root log D times this. But here we have something that is at most two times the same parameters over there, plus a second order term, which in most examples is of much smaller order than this. And as soon as that's the case, right, this inequality gives the same result as over here, but without the square root log. Does it make sense? So I'm just giving you some very quick impression about how this theory is. But the point is that this object over here is, tip, tip, you know, in many cases, we can prove a lower bound that's a, that's, that's a, is basically one plus the little one of the norm of X3. This really, as soon as the norm of the covariance matrix of X is small, this object really truly captures the behavior of these, these random matrices. And yet we are here in this very general setting where we're allowing an arbitrary mean encoding. So this is a kind of sharp, a kind of sharp refinement of the theorem of Luspi and PZA, it's sharp as soon as the norm of the covariance of matrix of X is of smaller order than, than the behavior of the So this talk is not about that, okay? But I want you to appreciate the sharpness, the fact that we have a constant one and that we can get exact type of results because that is what is motivating what is going um, Good. Now, everything I've said so far is about Gaussian random matrices. But of course, if you are actually working with random matrices, particularly if you're working with them out in the real world, you know, if you're coming from statistics or from theoretical computer science or areas like this, you rarely encounter Gaussian random matrices, right? Many of the random matrices one encounters are non-Gaussian. So what one would really like, if, if one wants to really apply these, these kind of results in a very general setting, what one would really like is to have non-Gaussian analogs of these kind of results, right? That can help us bound the norms of non-Gaussian matrices. In the spectra of non Gaussian. So the question is what kind of non Gaussian matrices should we study? Right? Now, it would be wonderful if we could have theorems that said something about given any random matrix at all with any joint distribution of its entries, right? Um, here is some bounds that often works, right? Let's say we can capture up to square, even if, you know, up to multiplicative factor square root log V or something. So far, I have never seen any hope that such a result could be true. I mean, probably if you allow any, you know, completely arbitrary joint distribution of the edges of a matrix, you could do basically anything. I don't know. Um, but so one needs to have some sort of good model of non-Gaussian random matrices for which you might want to, for which you might uh, be able to say something meaningful, right? So there's a bit of a tension here, right? So if you want to have useful results, you have to introduce some models of non-Gaussian random matrices, which on the one hand are sufficiently general that they capture many, many applications, right? And on the other hand are sufficiently special that you can have a powerful theory, mathematical theory that explains them in generality, right? I mean, that's kind of a tension. The less we assume about the models, the less you'll be able to say about them. So in this setting over here of these inequalities with multiplicative logarithmic terms, there has been a very successful theory of some non-Gaussian matrices, such non-Gaussian matrices, and I want to describe those, uh, those next. So there are certain models that have been extremely useful, particularly in applied mathematics, um, to which one can extend these type of inequalities. So this non-commutative Kinch inequality is for the Gaussian case. So um, what kind of models can we consider? So let's revisit for a moment the Gaussian. So let's say X is a Gaussian random matrix with mean zero for simplicity. Okay. So now such a matrix can always be written like this. Some I is one to N, AI times GI, where GI are IID standard Gaussians and AI are some deterministic matrices. This is simply because any jointly Gaussian distributed random variables can be written as linear combinations of independent Gaussian random variables, right? So here we've just, in each entry of the matrix, we've taken a linear combination of these GIs and the, and the, the coefficients are just the entries of the AIs. Does that make sense? So any mean zero Gaussian random matrix can be written as a linear combination of deterministic matrices with Gaussian coefficients. And you know, this is just a sum of independent random matrices, but of a very special form, right? It's just a scalar Gaussian times a deterministic matrix. So the kind of non-Gaussian model um, 
that is widely studied in the literature. Um, it consists simply, rather than taking a sum of A, I, G, I, you just consider a random matrix, which is a sum of arbitrary independent random matrix, where Z1 to Zn are independent random matrices with an arbitrary distribution. So these are independent, this is a sum of independent random matrices, but of a particular form, right? Deterministic matrix times a Gaussian scalar. Right? So, here you do not assume anything about ZI. So, at the moment, I'm not assuming anything about ZI. So, you know, the first thing that you should note, right, is that if I take N to be equal to one, then I've described here any, any random matrix, right? But of course, in the case N is equal to one, the inequalities we write down are not going to tell us anything. So, the question is what can we say about these models, right? But, um, um, but nonetheless, um, you know, so, so when n equals one, these inequalities shouldn't say anything, but nonetheless, such models that are sums of independent random matrices show up in many, many applications. Right? Let me give you some examples. For example, say you have, um, say you have a random matrix who's, who's, uh, that are patterned. So you take the entries of the matrix and you just choose some subsets of them where they're the same and, then, and they're independent across different subsets. This includes lots of random matrices that have been studied in the literature, you know, like for matrices with independent entries, right? There's matrices like, like uh, with um, um, like tuplets matrices or, or there's block matrices where you have different blocks that are independent, right? In general, I can take a matrix, right? And I can just choose some blocks Right? And I can make you know the entries between the blocks independent and inside I can do whatever, right? Take them the same, for example, right? And I could try to study the norm of these matrices. Right? What you would do is that each of the ZIs would just be the entries in its own block, right? And I would sum up those ZIs and I would get the full matrix. Does that make sense? So this is a kind of uh, you know, more or less any pattern matrix can be written as a sum of ZIs. And if you have enough of these blocks, then you'll have many terms in this. Another classical example are sample covariance matrices. Right? So this is a standard idea in statistics, right? So for example, um, if I have a bunch of vectors, x1 to xn are random vectors, let's say iid for simplicity, though that's not the most interesting case, right? So these are IID random vectors, let's say data that you get from some distribution, and I want to estimate the covariance of these um, uh, of these vectors, right? Well, the covariance matrix is exactly the expectation of XI times XI transpose. This is the covariance matrix of XI. But by the law of large numbers, right? The sample average of xi xi transpose, you know, you would hope if n is sufficiently large, is close to the sam to, to the true covariance. So this is called the sample covariance matrix. And a typical kind of question is is whether one can estimate the the, the error between the sample covariance matrix and the true covariance. Matrix. That makes sense. So this is a typical statistical problem. And here again, you see that you get a sum of independent rank one matrices, right? And the rank one matrices are the ZIs over here. And there are various other models in which these kind of things show up. So, and I will show other examples later. In. So this kind of model is a way of taking the Gaussian model and making it non-Gaussian in a way that captures many examples. Yes. How does n compare with the dimension of the matrix? Let me come back to that in a moment. So it's not n that's going to matter here, but uh, um, I'll come back to that in a moment. So um, what has been understood is that these Gaussian type of results, like non communication inequality, um, have very powerful extensions that extend to these kind of non-Gaussian models. And these type of inequalities uh, are popular in the literature under the name of matrix concentration inequality. Um, and, you know, for example, there is a very beautiful book by Joel Croft 
about such inequalities, which uh, surveys a lot of what is known in the literature. Um, and um, these kind of inequalities are wildly popular. I mean, you know, they're wildly popular, particularly in applied sciences like applied mathematics and statistics, because they're, you know, they apply to this extremely general class of Gaia matrices. You just apply it as a black box and you get inequalities that are basically sharp up to square root log. So, you know, they're so easy to use. And, you know, you get so much information from them that you can basically just, you know, it's like a hammer you can keep hitting on your problems and, you know, you always get something. You lose square root log these left and right, but you, you know, um, you, are, you, 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 you very easily get very non-trivial results from these, from these inequalities. So what do these inequalities look like, right? So, for example, here is the most, uh, you know, basic one. This is some form of the matrix Bernstein inequality. To Oliveira, two different proofs. Um, so we're now in this setting, right? So X is some I is one to N ZI. And the, the ZI are independent, mean zero. And we also assume they're bounded. So that the operator norm of each zi is bounded by some constant r, some non-random constant r. Right? Otherwise, we don't assume anything. They don't have to be Gaussian. They don't have to have any. We don't assume anything about their distribution, about the joint distribution of their entries. Right? So you do not assume they are iid. Right? No, 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 definitely not. Iid would be the the easy case. No, no, no. We assume they're independent, but they can have arbitrary distribution. All we assume they're independent, that they mean zero, and that they're bounded. Definitely not IID, right? All of the interesting applications will be when they're very much not I, I have the same. Um, I guess, you know, for sample covariance matrices, you have an IID situation. But for patterned matrices, they even live in, in completely different sets of entries, right? So that's... Uh... Then what do we get? Well, we get the same inequality as here. Exactly the same result. Well, that seems very suspicious because then I could just take n equals one and then I claim that this holds for any random matrix, right? Can't be true. So there has to be some correction term. The correction term is log D times R, R being the upper bound. So now you see if I take n to be equal to one, then x, is, let's say x is equal to z1, right? Then this inequality says that the expected norm of Z1 is bounded by log D times the up the uniform bound of the norm of Z1. But that doesn't tell us anything, right? That's a useless inequality. So for n is equal to one, this inequality doesn't tell us anything, right? But what does this inequality say? It says that you see this second order term only depends on the maximum of sizes of the sums, right? We have here a sum, X is a sum of n terms, right? This second order term only depends on the maximal size of the sum, right? But the expectation of x squared is exactly the sum i is one to n of the expectation of z i squared. Right. right, so this guy over here is the maximum size of the summons, but this guy is really a sum of the sum. So as soon, right, as the largest term of this sum is of smaller order than the whole sum, right, then one hopes that this second order term will be negligible, and then you basically reduce back to the Gaussian. Right? So that's the way that you should look at this inequality. This term over here behaves like the sum of the squares of the zi with a square root, but this term behaves like the maximum of the zi. Right? So typically, right, in most cases, this R will be much, much less than this guy over here. And as soon as it's less by a logarithmic factor than that guy, then this term will dominate and you have exactly the same behavior as in the Gaussian. Does that make sense? So, you know, there are many variations on these bounds in the literature. Again, I highly recommend the book by Trop. It has uh, numerous variations on this bound. Also, usually these bounds are not formulated for expectations, but they give tail bounds. 
on the norm, right? They say the probability that the norm is greater than square root log d times that plus that is bounded by, right? Um, this is more an artifact of the proof than uh, uh, than an actual difference, okay? But 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 you can uh, uh, okay, one can derive tail bounds. So um, so this shows you a, a, a typical way in which um, a Gaussian result like that one can be extended, once you give the right kind of model, can be extended to a very large class, a very large and useful class of non-Gaussian matrices. And these matrices can be highly patterned, right? They can have, just like the Gaussian model with an arbitrary mean and covariance, right? These matrices can have basically arbitrary covariances and they can have all sorts of complicated dependencies, right? These kind of matrices can be very, very far away from the type of mean field models that are studied in classical random matrices. Now, how are these um, how are these bounds proved, right? So we have this Gaussian result, and then here we have a non-Gaussian result. Right? So there are basically two approaches in the literature to proving these non-Gaussian results. Um, So the first method So the first method is just to find a proof of the Gaussian result that works the same way in the non-Gaussian case. And this is really what was done by Paul. Right? So there is various different proofs of the Gaussian results, but there is some way of proving the Gaussian results, which really doesn't use Gaussianity anymore. Right? Do they use some Lindebarg argument? Or... Do they use what? Lindebarg kind of argument? No, no, no. So the way that, that Trapp does these bounds is he bounds the moment generating functions of these matrices. Um, so you bound something like the trace of E, the expectation of the trace of E to the lambda likes Z1 plus Zn. Right? And you want to find some bound that looks like E to the lambda squared times whatever you want here, right? The, the expectation of X squared, I don't know, over two, right? For lambda is less than uh, R, and there's some D here, something like this, right? You want some bound like this, right? And uh, you know, if you had such a bound in the model generating function, you can turn it into a tail bound in the usual. Right? I just say this for if you know what, what this means. Right? So the point is that that if you want to bound the model generating function, now the problem is this is the exponential of a matrix. These matrices don't commute with each other, right? But uh, you know, uh, you can basically replace the usual kind of uh, manipulations with moment generating functions if you have a trace inequality of some sort that allows you to apply the same manipulations here. And uh, Trapp uses for this Leaps concavity inequality, which is or Leaps convexity inequality. I don't remember which one exactly, but there's basically inequalities that allow you to bound, you know, work with the moment log moment generating functions of matrices. And basically, once you have the right kind of matrix inequality, you can mimic the proofs of scalar concentration inequality, and everything works the same way. So you know, Trapp calls this the matrix Bernstein inequality, basically because once you have the right matrix. Uh, you know, trace inequality for matrices, you can literally repeat the proof of the Bernstein inequality for sums of scalar random variables in the matrix. Right? And the real difficulty is to deal with non-commutativity. Right? So how is the matrix inequality? So there you have to read Trapp's, Trapp's book. I don't think I can go into it right now. Okay. Um, but you, this is a good excuse to also explain why this loses so much. So this method loses greatly. It loses all these logarithmic factors left and right. And the reason is that by you're mimicking the proof of the in, of inequalities for sums of scalar random variables. You're just trying to repeat the proof of sums of matrix random variables. Right? But matrices are not scalars, right? They don't commute. So the fact that you can do that means that you have to ignore non-commutativity. Right? So the fact that these inequalities work means that non-commutativity doesn't make things any worse than the scalar case. But in fact, non-commutativity makes things a lot better. The reason random matrices, uh, you know, should not have these log Ds in many cases is because non-commutativity of DZIs typically makes random matrices behave a lot better than scalar random variables. 
And that cannot be captured by mimicking the proofs of scalar concentration. And that's exactly why we have to introduce these non-commutative objects X free, which are really non-commutative objects that capture the non-commutativity between the, the, the objects. Like I have a very silly question. Yes. Uh, in non commutative that uh, you often deal with these non crossing partitions and they grow exponentially, right? Instead of, I think this is taking us very far afield from where we are right now. Let's 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 move on with the. I, I think this is going to take us uh, extremely far from the talk, okay? So please ask me afterwards. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, the only point I'm trying to make here is that, you know, what, how can we prove a non-Gaussian result once we know how to prove the Gaussian result? One way to do it is to realize that our proof of the Gaussian result never really used the fact that we're Gaussian. Right? Now, you know, the original proofs of the non-commutative Kinchin equality did use Gaussianity or the fact that you have random signs, which were, which, which were the original versions, but, um, but one can discover new proofs, right, that do not involve, that do not really care what the summons are, and then those new proofs will work equally for this, um, uh, for this model. Right? The other way is you can derive them from the Gaussian case by symmetrization. And this, this is a simple trick that allows you to derive the non-Gaussian results from the Gaussian results. <laughs> Roughly speaking, here is how it works. Let me assume for simplicity, okay, this is not necessary by another trick, but let's imagine for a moment that rather than having mean zero, actually these ZIs are symmetric. So ZI and minus ZI have the same distribution. Okay. If that were true, then ZI would have the same distribution as ZI times a random sign, right? So then I could, I could stick random signs in here, epsilon. Okay. Now, random signs are almost like Gaussian. So, so what I could now do, right? So for example, what I could do is I could take some i epsilon i z i, right? I can even put in here, let me do it like this. I could put in here, if I multiply here by the expectation of a standard Gaussian variable, right? then I could write this as the expect expected norm of the expectation with respect to the Gaussian variables of some i, epsilon i, g i, with an absolute value z i. And then by Jensen, I can move the expectation with respect to the Gaussian random variables outside. And I have epsilon i times the absolute value of a Gaussian, which is just a Gaussian. So if I started with something like this, right, then I can, uh, if I want to bound the norm, then up to some constant factor, I can always stick Gaussians in here, scalar Gaussians. And then what I can do is I can apply the Gaussian result conditionally on ZI. If I condition on the original ZIs, now I just have a Gaussian random matrix left, and I can apply the Gaussian result conditionally on that. And using such a technique, you can always reduce these kind of inequalities to Gaussian inequality, right? So it turns out that what you do is you bound the expected norm of some i z i by some universal constant times the expected norm of some i g i z i where g i are i i d standard Gaussians. Now conditionally on z i you have a Gaussian random matrix to which you can apply the non commutative Kinchin inequality. But of course now you have a random right hand side, but you can basically do it again and end up with this inequality. So using such a trick, you can derive the Gauss the non Gaussian inequality from the Gaussian. So again, you know, this, I mean, this went far too fast for you to see how it works, but I mean, uh, these are standard tricks that one can apply. And, and you, if you see it once, it's, it's, it's a routine uh, technique. So these are basically the two techniques in the literature to deal with non-Gaussian model, right? That allow you to, 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 to prove inequalities very much like a Gaussian. But these kind of um, inequalities so far have been only applied to non-commutative Kinchin-like inequality, right? This entire area of matrix concentration inequalities is essentially devoted to proving analogs of the non-commutative Kinchin inequality for, um, for these kind of non-Gaussian models. And there are extensions beyond that that are, that are also interesting, but they are again extensions of the non-commutative Kinchin inequality to even further type of models, uh, non-Gaussian. Now, I started the talk by reminding you of the, uh, what, the, what we have a sharp inequality, right? So um, 
for Gaussian random matrices, we now have much sharper inequalities that often capture the exact um, that often capture the exact behavior of of, of non of Gaussian random matrices. And so it would be really great if we had non-Gaussian analogs of these of these results, right? Because non-Gaussian analogs of these results would be much more applicable to many different sets. Um, but the problem is that neither of these methods of proof seem to be very uh, um, promised. So the issue with symmetrization, there are several issues with symmetrization, but one of them is you can apply it, of course, to our Gaussian inequalities. But in this method, you always lose a constant. And if you're talking about these kind of inequalities that are only sharp up to square root log D, then losing a constant doesn't make any difference whatsoever. Right? But if you're talking about having sharp inequalities, which give you the exact, the right leading order behavior, as soon as you, as you lose a constant, they're not sharp anymore. Right? So you can never use a method like symmetrization to derive sharp inequalities. On the other hand, you know, one of the reasons why you can have such powerful methods of proof for these non-commutative-like inequalities, right, that, uh, that work in much more general settings, is that, that these inequalities are somehow very, um, you know, these inequalities are somehow very simple. They behave like scalar inequalities, right? The method of proofs of these inequalities is exactly the same as scalar inequalities. Now, in, in, in the sharp theory, like we use, uh, you know, it may be possible that one could, you know, somehow with a lot of pain and suffering develop some non-Gaussian version of the proof. But, um, you know, we use very heavily Gaussian analysis in the proof. So it's, it's completely unclear that one can have kind of a method of proof that's somehow in a natural way gives rise to non-Gaussian. So what we realize is that, and I believe this is actually the right way to think about this problem, is one that is familiar from classical random matrix theory, which is the notion of universality. So in classical random matrix theory, these type of questions also arise, right? Let's say I take Gaussian victim matrices with IID entries. The nice thing about Gaussian matrices with IID entries is that you can compute their distributions exactly, right? Because of the symmetry. And those exact computations then allow you to study the limits of these things in a very hands-on way. Yeah? It becomes a matter of classical analysis. Now you want to understand that if I have matrices with IID entries with a different distribution, that you get the same limiting behavior. And basically what, what has been shown in increasing detail by, 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 uh, by various groups is that in many cases, cases of classical random matrix theory, non-Gaussian matrices behave like Gaussian matrices. And the point is that um, the point is that you prove this independently from the behavior of the Gaussian matrix, right? First, you prove a universality result, which says that the behavior of the non-Gaussian matrix is like the Gaussian matrix, right? And then for the Gaussian matrix, you prove using whatever special Gaussian formulas you want, beautiful behavior of Gaussian matrices. And as soon as you have a universality result, you can transfer that information to the behavior of the non-Gaussian matrix. And there have been many techniques that have been developed in classical random matrix theory to study this kind of universal. But these techniques are very much restricted to the kind of classical random matrix models that people study, matrices with independent entries, for example, or you know, mean field type models, right? Well, all of the entries have to have variances of the same order. I mean, this is very important for these kind of computations to go. So on the other hand, we have this rather general model, sums of arbitrary independent random matrix. And what we realized is that there is this, this, this model that is so widely used in the theory of matrix concentration inequalities is actually perfectly adapted to prove a kind of universality result. So these universality results are now not asymptotic, they're non-asymptotic. So here is, a, here is, for example, one of our, one, one of our results. So let's X, no, I mean, I'm not, because it's, uh, I, I'm not going to take it to have non zero mean, so let's write it like this. Um, right, so Z0 is non random. 
Z i has uh, are uh, independent u zero. Right, so I just write these are independent mean zero random matrices. This one is non-random. That's just the mean. Okay, just for um, so this is our general model. And um, let's assume again that the norm of all these zi's is bounded by R, right? Just like in the matrix Bernstein inequality. Now I'm going to introduce a Gaussian random matrix. Let G be the Gaussian random matrix. With the same mean and covariance of the entry as X. So I pick a Gaussian random matrix whose entries have the same mean and covariance as the non Gaussian matrix. Now the claim is that when this parameter R is small, the Gaussian matrix will behave like the non Gaussian matrix. Okay. So there are many different ways of writing this. So let me write one. For example, we have such an inequality. So the distance between the spectrum of X and the spectrum of G, and this is the Hausdorff distance. So this is just, for example, this would, you know, this upper bounds anything like the, the, the norms, right? So the, the difference between the norm of X and the norm of G is upper bounded by the distance. Okay, so the Hausdorff distance. So the, the probability that the spectrum of X and the spectrum of G are far apart right, is greater than, let's see now. So I need sigma star square root log D plus R to the one third sigma to the two thirds. I will define these things in a moment. Log D, sorry, I need a T. Sigma star times the square root T. Here I have T to the two thirds plus R times T is less or equal E D times E to the minus maybe over constant. Um, and I have to define what all these parameters mean, right? So R here is the bound on the summons. Sigma is just the thing. Say again? Uh, this VI norm is any normal spectral norm. Spectral norm, spectral norm. Okay. Yeah. Um, sigma is the same quantity we had before, the, you know, except that I now have to subtract the mean, right? Because I now took non-zero mean, right? So this is the same quantity we had before. And sigma star, I don't really want to define what it is, but it's even smaller than that parameter. Remember that the norm of the covariance matrix of X is what controls how, how well the Gaussian matrix behaves. The sigma star is even smaller than that. So in any situation where we have nice results, you know, sigma star will be very small. Okay. So this guy is small. So we should focus on these terms. And these terms are, all have an R in them. Right? So for example, as soon as R, R is much less than sigma times some log of the dimension, you see, because the dimension is here in front. So if I want to cancel this dimension here, I have to take T to be like log D, right? So as soon as R, right, as what basically what this result is saying, maybe it's hard to see in this particular formulation, but what this result is saying is that as soon as R over the norm of the expectation of X minus the expectation of X squared, right? So this is the maximum of the norms of these guys. Maximum i greater than one, right? Is much, much less than one over log d to some power. I think maybe four in this notation. Then the spectrum of x is basically behaves like the spectrum. Of x. And this is true no matter how you bound the spectrum of the Gaussian. Group. So for example, if I combine this result with the non-commutative kitchen inequality, if I were to bound the norm of G using the non-commutative kitchen inequality, and then I apply this result, I perfectly recover the, the matrix Bernstein inequality. 
exactly the same with the same power of log of anything. So this provides a kind of new explanation for why the matrix variance inequality is true. The matrix variance inequality in the literature is always viewed as a kind of extension of the Gaussian, uh, right, of the Gaussian case, right? But here we see it just, you know, once you understand that these matrices under the condition when R is small, these matrices actually behave like the Gaussian one. And then you can just reduce the behavior. But because this measures the distance of X from G, right? You can use this to get sharp in the course. And so when you combine such a universality results with, um, with the results for Gaussian matrices that I talked about earlier, um, then you get basically perfect extensions of this Gaussian theory to the non kind of non-Gaussian models that appear in matrix concentration. So the picture here should really be, if we combine everything, it should really be this. Say we have um, a non-Gaussian matrix, randomly. So it's of the form sum i z i plus z zero. So associated to sort of random matrix is a Gaussian random matrix with the same mean and covariance as the entries of X. Right? Now associated to this is some deterministic operator. X. So here, if R is much, much less than sigma, right? If R is small, R, R is the maximum of the summons, then X behaves like the Gaussian guy. Right? And here, if the norm of the covariance matrix of the entries is small, the Gaussian one behaves like the free one. So if you have both of them, then the non-Gaussian matrix behaves like the free one. But these two phenomena are really completely separate things. There is one reason why a non-Gaussian matrix behaves like a Gaussian matrix. And there's another completely different reason why a Gaussian matrix behaves like this deterministic Gaussian. So these are really two separate phenomena, but when you put them together, you get a powerful hammer that you can use to, to prove also. Is it okay? Yes. A couple of questions. So uh, normal covariance that's being small, does that mean that the entries are more or less independent or no, not, not, at all. not at all? Not at all. I can give examples of that uh, if you want to. But, uh, yeah. Okay. I, I, yes, what is the other question? Uh, the question is, you're talking about the distance between two spectrums, which is two sets, right? Yes. So, I mean, they're, they're just supports of the uh, spectral distribution. Exactly. Can you tell me something about the difference between the spectral distributions per se? Absolutely. So we have all sorts of different, like, uh, also, this is also true over here. That, that we have a very flexible technique that you can apply to all sorts of different spectral distributions. So there's a whole you know, list of theorems you can get. This is one of them. For example, one can get two-sided estimates for the moment. Right, so you get something like, right? so you can get, for example, the expected trace of x to the 2p to the one over 2p, right? So the opinor minus the same thing with g, right? And then you get something that's bounded by R to the one third sigma to the two thirds P to the two thirds plus RP, right? Something like, right? Or you can get the same thing with the steel just transform, or you can get the same thing with the moments of the result. Or, you, you know, basically any spectral statistic you think of, you will get a similar test. So indeed the spectral distributions are also true. I'm mostly concentrating on the on the supports of the spectrum simply to compare it with the non communication in the course. Okay, I mean, I think I'm getting close to the end of the talk. But when did we start? 25. Ah, so I have five minutes. No, we have seven minutes. Seven minutes. Wow, uh, two more. Okay, so um, I just want to give you some, some you know, the kind of uh, hints of some application. So, The first one is kind of funny because it doesn't use any of this theory at all over here. Don't need that. So um, <laughs> let's talk about random graphs. Okay. So um, we're interested in, let's say, uh, um, K regular random, let's say, multi graph. 
So a multigraph is a graph that um, it's like a graph, but two points can have multiple edges, right? I mean, you don't just have one edge connecting at most one edge connecting. Now, you know, there are many different models of, of K regular multigraphs. There's not just one model, you know? So for example, one thing you could do is take all K regular graphs and pick one uniformly at random, right? This is the uniform model. Um, but that one actually is, is uh, in the literature, many other types of models are studied in part because the, K, the random K regular graph tends to be harder to study. So um, there is something called the configuration model of random graphs. This is also a very popular one. And the third very popular one is the permutation model of, of K-regular. So if we talk about the permutation model, of a, so in the permutation model, how do you generate a K-regular multigraph on N vertices? Well, what you do is you draw um, phi one to phi k are IID random permutation matrices of uh, of n points. Right? So I just draw k IID n by n permutation matrices. Each one of them chosen uniformly at random over all permutation matrices. And then I just take the adjacency matrix of my um, of my graph on n vertices to be the sum of these permutations. Right, so this is an n by n matrix. Its entries are, you know, are, are, are integers, 0, 1, or 2, and 3, right? So each entry is the number of edges between those two vertices, right? So because it's a multigraph, there can be more than one edge between two vertices. But every vertex is connected to exactly k other vertices, right? And therefore, this is a model of random. Now, um, one of the classical questions in random graphs is what is the um, spectral gap of the adjacency matrix of a random graph? So because this is a K regular graph by perot frobenius the largest eigenvector is just a vector of all ones. So let's subtract it out. So let's take the adjacency matrix minus, and so now we have to divide K over N times, right? So I've subtracted off the top eigenvector. Right. I've subtracted off the top eigenvector, so the norm of that will be the second eigenvector. Right. So the question is, how big is it? Right. So the classical result is that if k is fixed and n goes to infinity, this converges to square root two k minus two, two square root k minus one. Right. This is the classical result about about so the spectral gap of random graphs, right? Um, and this number here is special significance because this is also the norm of the adjacency matrix of an infinite K regular tree. So the behavior of these, of these sparse matrices, right? And the limit behaves like the norm of the adjacency matrix of an infinite tree. And that's not a coincidence. So this is if the degree is fixed and the number of vertices goes to infinity. Now, what would happen if you allowed the degree to grow with the number of vertices? So if you go and you look at where these kind of things are proved for K fixed, right? The proof, you know, struggles more, you know, you could try to grow K a little bit, right? And all the estimates would still work out. But the proofs struggle more and more and more as you let K grow, right? So if K grows too quickly as a function of N, all the proofs break down and it's completely unclear what happens with these, uh, with these models. Right? And it turns out, you know, I wasn't even aware of this, but it turns out that the question about what is the behavior of these, uh, JC matrices when K grows with N seems to be an open problem. You know, there's a paper of uh, Yao and co-authors somewhere where they review the, what is known and they say nothing is known about the permutation model when K grows. With N. But you know, this model is of course a very simple case of our general result. This is the sum of independent random matrices, right? Or you can just stuff it into the universality principle. What will it say? It says, roughly speaking, that when k is larger than, let's say, log of the number of vertices to some power, maybe let's say four, right? Then a n minus k over n divided by two square root k or square root k behaves like a Wigner matrix. 
right? Because this matrix has entries that mean zero and variance one, basically, right? Well, that's it. Then you know everything. So it's just a. I beg your pardon. So, what we prove is the, that the norm is will be the same as the norm of the Wigner matrix, and that the spectral distribution will be the same as the spectral distribution of a of a Wigner matrix. We cannot say anything about the local regime, right? The Tracy rhythm fluctuations and things like this. Now, in this case, because the model is so simple, that may or may not be true. I don't know. But even even actually the norm, the value of the norm doesn't seem to have been there. Of course, you conjecture that it should be exactly like this, but k grows two square root k. But this appears to be outside of reach of techniques of random graphs. But here we need to know nothing about random graphs, just a simple application. Of the... I want to say one more quick thing about sample covariance matrices and then I'll end. So, by the way, this is actually not the most interesting statement about random graphs. Um, there is a much right, so this is a very simple model, but there's a very nice story about what's called random k lifts of a deterministic graph. So if you take a deterministic graph, let's say a graph G with a fixed number of vertices, I can form a k lift as follows make k copies of the original graph. So each of those had just have their own vertices connecting to each other according to the original graph. So every vertex is copied k times. And then what you do is you just randomly permute the connections of the k vertices in the k layer. So given any base graph, you can now form a sequence of random graphs with k going to infinity. Does that make sense? And then the natural conjecture is that instead of getting the adjacency matrix of the k regular tree, that the norm should converge to the norm of the adjacency matrix of the universal cover of the base graph. That is the correct state. And this was proved in a huge breakthrough paper by Bordenov and Collins uh, some years ago, that this is in fact true when the degree is fixed. And the same technique that I'm showing you here is able to establish that this is true if k is growing with n by reducing it basically to the gap. Okay, so, so even something like this. Let me just very quickly say something about sample covariance matrices and then I'll okay, So we have a sample covariance. So let's say we have a bunch of random vectors, right? So the sample covariance matrix is some i is one to n, x i, x i transpose minus the x. So we want to show the sample covariance matrix is slow to two. So we would like to bound this. Now, this is an interesting model, turns out. It's, a, it's unexpected what is going on. On the one hand, this is a sum of independent random matrices. Therefore, one way that you could apply universality is to try to show that the behavior of this matrix is the same as the behavior of a Gaussian matrix with the same mean and covariance. Does that make sense? That would be a direct application of the universality principle. It turns out that that works great as long as n is larger than some log of the, of, of the dimension of the vector. So when n is sufficiently large compared to the log of the dimension of the vectors, this matrix behaves like a Gaussian. That's a direct application of the universality principle. But when n is smaller than some than the log of the dimension, this doesn't work for you. Um, sorry, it's like n is greater than d log. Then, then you get, then you get. On the other one, there's a different way of applying universality. Let's take these vectors and put them as columns in the matrix. Right, so let's make a matrix X whose columns are these data vectors. Right? Then I can view the sample covariance matrix as X, X transpose minus its expectation. <clears throat> so first what I said is let's take this whole matrix and see if it behaves like a Gaussian matrix. But another thing you could say is maybe that matrix behaves like a Gaussian matrix. And then this matrix would behave like a sample a Gaussian sample covariance matrix. These are two completely different ways that you could have universality in this case, right? Either the sample covariance matrix itself behaves like a Gaussian matrix, or the data behave as though they're Gaussian and you form the, the sample covariance matrix of the Gaussian data, right? Does that make sense? It turns out that you can apply the kind of universality principle we have in both ways, right? You can either try to prove this, or you can try to prove that this is behaves like Gaussian. 
And what happens is that they work in completely complementary regimes. When n is large, this matrix behaves like it's Gaussian. But when n is small, then x behaves like it's Gaussian, and this matrix behaves like it's a Gaussian sample covariance matrix. And in most situations, in some precise sense, those regimes overlap very nicely, right? So this guy behaves Gaussian when n is this large, and you have this picture over here when n is this small, and therefore you capture more or less the whole regime, but you have to apply the, the universality to the correct, um, to the correct object. So even when you have universality, it's not exactly clear how to apply it, right? You have to make sure that you apply it to the correct thing that behaves like a Gaussian given situation. All right, let me end here. Thank you. Do you know the bounds here? On the GD star minus expectation of GD star, what's the bound? Now minus? you go, okay. <laughs> yes. Let me continue. I mean, the analog of the expectation. Mm -hmm. I'll just write one. Uh, expectation of X star, expectation of GG star, and, and the thing for X3 are all the same. So just the variances, right? They're the same always. So, you know, well, as long as then, you know, you have the right, the right condition, this will be like X3. And this you can compute. There are formulas. So, um, I mean, one can even compute, right? So it's easy to estimate these things. So I can write down for you up to a universal constant. I can write down something very explicit. I have to think that I can remember off the top of my head, but up to universal constant, this is very easy to compute. But even the, you know, the exact thing is harder to compute, but it's given by some kind of variation. So, um, yes, absolutely. So, but the question is, right, do you go like this or do you replace this by Gaussian? Question? Yeah. Uh, Questions from the online audience. So uh, I have a question, Arjit. Yeah, please. please. Yeah. So is there any hope of? Uh, I think Arjit already asked this, getting to the extremes, and uh, doing something similar. Can you please repeat the question? Uh, there, okay, yeah, Arjit, yeah. can you repeat it, please? Is there any hope of getting to the extremes and doing something similar? What are the extremes? The uh, largest hanging value. No, no. The extreme value, which, which random variable has the extreme value distribution. The, uh, no, no, no. I mean, he means the, I think he means the I largest hanging value. The, the, rather than the norm? Yeah. Is that what you mean? Yes, yes. That's I what I mean, yes. You want to study separately the largest and the smallest eigenvalue as opposed to the norm? The norm is the maximum of the absolute values of the eigenvalues, right? <coughs> I, I, I'm trying to understand if I have the correct question. So we're talking here about bounding the norm of A. Right? That's like the maximum. Right. So are you simply asking me whether I can study these two things separately? They may not be the same, of course, rather than studying the norm. Is that the question? I, yes, yes, yes. Ah, yes. In fact, we can say much more because, you know, we have the house coefficients between the spectrum. So what this means, right? So the, the, the meaning of this distance is that if this is less than epsilon, then every eigenvalue of X is within distance epsilon of some eigenvalue of G. And every eigenvalue of G is within distance epsilon of some eigenvalue of X. Does that make sense? Okay. So what that means is that you see, I mean, lambda max of X has to be close to lambda max of G. And lambda min of x has to be close to lambda min of g because they're on the extremes. But for example, it also shows, right, if, this, if the spectrum has some, right, it could, for example, for sample covariance matrices, 
um, well, maybe not for the usual ones, but it's possible to have the eigenvalues having, you know, multiple, the, the distribution of the eigenvalues having multiple bumps, right? They don't have the support of these distributions of the eigenvalues doesn't have to be connected. You can have distribute, uh, you can have random matrices where the eigenvalue distribution has multiple bumps, right? So for example, not just, we know not just that the largest eigenvalue is here and the smallest eigenvalue is here, but we also know that, for example, there cannot be any eigenvalues in here, and there cannot be any eigenvalues in here, right? Because every eigenvalue, of, if, if the eigenvalues of G look like this, right? Every eigenvalue of X has to be close to an eigenvalue of G. So you cannot have eigenvalues of X here, which are very far from the eigenvalues of G. Does that make sense? So you know somehow that the entire support of the spectrum is converging to the support of the spectrum of G. So converging is close to the support of the spectrum of G. So you can separately study the largest eigenvalue and the smallest eigenvalue. You can study the internal edges also. And you can study here and here and here and here. And you can study the closeness of the distribution, which is something that you cannot access at all by, by matrix concentration. Did I answer the question? I'm not actually sure. No, no, it's okay. It's okay. Thank you. Yeah. What we cannot study is the local, right? The, we cannot study the distribution of the largest eigenvalue, right? Like Tracy Widom. Yeah, you cannot do the Tracy Widom fluctuation. Yeah. I understand. Yeah. Now, there's a good reason why we can't study that because they're just false. <laughs> At this level of generality, they're not true. Um, there is no local universality for, for non homogeneous random matrices. The Tracy Witten fluctuations are almost never true. They're only true in classical random matrix theory. But this kind of uh, mm -hmm. fluctuations are very special to Wigner type matrices. Um, and it's, there, there are many examples. It's very well known that there are many examples of non homogeneous matrices that don't behave like Tracy Witten at all. Right? So um, there's no hope of, of, of capturing something like that uh, at this level of generality. Okay. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Any other questions? What about the Saturn P norm estimates? I mean, instead of operator norm, uh, yes. If you I want to, this is anything like this is fine. Well, the whole, the entire spectral distribution we can do. So the, a, a, any, you know, uh, yes, uh, all all of these things will be fine, right? They will be close, right? and you get inequalities like this. I, I think I wrote it before. These are the shaft norms, exactly, right? Yes. So X minus the same thing as G. And let me write these. So this is a good example because everything is really clear. Okay, so. So here, okay. So you see here's the shaft and P norm of X, here's the shaft and P norm of G. In this case, it's a very clean bound. This is bounded by some constant. I don't remember what, some universal constant. I can even write R times P squared okay, if I want. So you see, as if R is small, then all of the shot and P norms are, are, are close to this. Right? On the other hand, the theory that I talked about in Delhi, in this case, also has a very clean statement. So the difference between the shot and the norm of the Gaussian matrix and of X3, this one is bounded, here I remember the constant, it's two times the norm of the covariance matrix of X to the one fourth times this parameter sigma square root. Remember sigma was just the, the square root of the norm of the expectation of X squared, but the centered one. Right? times P to the three quarters. So you see there are two completely separate phenomena, right? The Gaussian matrix is close to the non-Gaussian matrix when R is small. The free object is close to the Gaussian matrix when the norm of the covariance matrix of X is small. All of these inequalities are completely explicit. Right? And they're non-asymptotic. So you can use them as ingredients in whatever else you want. So Schatten norms are actually particularly simple. And then they, they, this is the first thing you prove are Schatten norms because they're the easiest toy case. All of the other results are harder um, because one uses nastier spectral statistics to study them. Schatten norms, because they're polynomials, are very clean and the proofs look much nicer than in the general case. 
but but you get very explicit inequalities and you can just uh, you know so if you combine those two things you get you get some kind of uh, uh, you know matrix Bernstein type uh, inequality but there are two sides right? <laughs> there are absolute values in both of these inequalities right so everything is close together when these two pair are triggered. Thanks. Yes. Any other questions? Okay, let's thank.